Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fernanda Ziober, and I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics at the Frey University Amsterdam. Abralin ao vivo is an initiative from Abralin, Brazilian Association for Linguistics, in cooperation with many organizations, including the International Permanent Committee of Linguistics, the Latin America Associations for Linguistics and Philology, the Argentinian Society for Linguistics Studies, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistic Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. Today, I have the honor to introduce Professor Martin Haspomot. He is a researcher at Max Planck Institute since 1998, and he is an honorary professor at the University of Leipzig. He has worked in various groundbreaking projects in linguistic typology, namely the World Atlas of Language Structures, among others. These projects have allowed people around the world to explore language diversity. Professor Haspomat is going to present us the lecture, How Evolutionary Adaptation Explains Language Structures. We would like to thank you, Professor, for joining us today at this important initiative. Welcome. Okay, so am I on? Okay, so um, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak in the series. That's really great. I'm uh, uh, quite happy uh, to have been selected for this prestigious uh, occasion. I think it's wonderful that Abralin is organizing this. Um, <clears throat> I'm um, right now actually sitting in my office in Leipzig. Um, prim my primary work is, as Fernanda mentioned, at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena. Um, but I live in Leipzig, and Leipzig University uh, has a nice office for me, and the uh, COVID situation in Germany is such that I can be in my office. And uh, in the background, you see the flag of the SLE conference that we organized here um, last year. So that's sort of where I am. And now I, I will start uh, sharing my screen and then start talking, okay? So, can you see it now? Yeah, okay, good. So, um, my title is, as Fernanda mentioned, How Evolutionary Adaptation Explains Language Structures. Um, and the, uh, I start with a very strong claim, namely that most successful explanations of language structures are based on evolutionary adaptation. By the way, at the bottom uh, of uh, this slide, you see uh, the URL uh, for the slides where you can download it. I uploaded uh, the slides uh, to Zenodo. Um, okay, so I still have to practice. Uh, uh, moving. Okay, so it's really important to realize that uh, when I talk about evolutionary adaptation, I'm talking about cultural evolution, not biological evolution. Another thing that's really important is that by explaining structures, I mean the explanation of general tendencies in the world's languages. So worldwide tendencies of the sort that we um, have in the World Atlas of Language Structures that Fernanda already mentioned. So uh, maybe if you take these two things into account, it's less surprising that I should be claiming that most successful explanations of language structures are based on evolutionary adaptation. So let's look at some initial examples. For example, standard Arabic has a triangular vowel system e, u, a, or Portuguese has a contrast between present tense and future tense, ela caminha versus ela caminhará or Mandarin Chinese as the contrast between cardinal and ordinal numerals. Sun is three, di sun, the third, liu, six, di liu, the sixth, or the English dative alternation, Kim gave him the money, Kim gave it to her brother. Uh, in Japanese, we have the reflexive pronoun jibun, as in taro wa kagami de jimonomita, Taro saw himself in the mirror that contrasts with Taro saw him in the mirror, uh, where we have kario, but the him is optional. 
So phenomena such as these represent general tendencies and can be explained by evolutionary adaptation. Now, the idea that biological evolution and evolution of languages are related has a long history. And in fact, Charles Darwin himself, the originator of biological evolutionary theory was interested in the development of languages and he interacted with linguists such as August Schleicher, the first linguist who talked about uh, linguistic evolution in a similar sense as biological evolution in the 1860s. He was a professor at the University of Jena, not far away from the Max Planck Institute where I work. And also Max Müller um, took an interest in evolution. He was originally from Leipzig actually, then later worked uh, at the University of Oxford. And I was interested recently to read that he went to school in the building that's right next uh, to the office where I sit right now in Leipzig. Um, <clears throat> now the similarities between the genealogical trees of linguistics and the phylogenetic trees of the biologists uh, became apparent very quickly. So August Schleicher drew trees and Darwin also started drawing trees and the trees that we make nowadays using quantitative uh, methods are quite clearly very similar to these older trees and Russell Gray uh, who works on these kinds of quantitative genealogical trees in Jena uh, is very conscious of this pedigree going back all the way to August Schleicher. But biologists use evolutionary histories not only to explain the similarities between species that have a common descent, they also use them to explain adaptation. Many traits of animals and plants can be explained as adaptations to their environment. This is very well known. For example, fins of animals that live in water, or wings of animals that live on trees, eyes in animals that live above the surface, or white fur of animals that live in snowy regions. Now my claim is that many structural features of languages can be explained by adaptations in much the same way as in biology. So both in biological and linguistic change, we have evolutionary processes. In uh, <clears throat> these evolutionary processes consists of three main components, the creation of variants in biology, that's by gene mutation, replication, that is reproduction in biology, and the selective retention of variants, that is natural selection in biology. Linguistic change, we have analogous evolutionary processes. The creation of variants is the innovations by speakers. Replication is the transmission to other speakers. And selective retention, is a diffusion of propagation of selected variants, social selection, and also functional selection. In the context of evolutionary adaptation, it's in particular functional selection that is relevant. I recommend a paper by Nettle, 1999, a very illuminary, illuminating discussion of the parallels, including similar challenges. This is a paper that's hardly known among linguists, and, and uh, I think it's, it, it helped me a lot understand these things. There are a number of um, books about the parallels in linguistics, but these books are a bit difficult. So Croft's Explaining Language Change, Nicolas Ritz, Selfish Sounds, um, and Juliette Blevins, Evolutionary Phonology. But few linguists have linked these ideas to the wider field of cultural evolution. Cultural evolution is one approach to studying human cultures often in a worldwide perspective. There's a very nice textbook by Alex Mizudi and many papers in this tradition. And I think it would be useful if linguists began to link their research more to this larger field of cultural evolution. It seems that so far the idea of adaptation has really caught on only in phonology. For example, Caleb Everett, he gave a talk a couple of weeks ago in the Abralin series uh, on uh, global phonetic patterns, what they tell us about language. And he asked, why do languages, more specifically spoken languages, take the forms that they do? How much of a role does ease of articulation play? Do they evolve and adapt like other features of cultural evolution, sensitive to anatomical environmental factors? Well, his answer is um, yes, 
And uh, um, I completely agree with him. In morphosyntax, the explanatory power of evolutionary ad adaptation has typically been overlooked. And I will discuss why later in this talk. It's also important uh, to note that one focus of evolutionary thinking by linguists has been on the evolution of the biological capacity for language or human linguisticality. In the textbook Evolutionary Linguistics, this largely deals with biological evolution of linguisticality, not so much with the cultural evolution of particular languages, but these are really two different things. So we have to begin with convergent evolution. By the way, again, I have the URL for the slides at the bottom of this slide. So I have all the references also uh, in this uh, document on Zenodo. So again, it's quite well known. Everyone learns this in the biology classes that animals from different biological phyla often have similar traits because they were subject to similar selective pressures. So we have um, types of fish, reptiles, and mammals. They have very similar shapes with uh, fins and so on for living in water. Or we have birds, dinosaurs, and bats, a type of mammal uh, that have similar wings uh, because they fly. Now, languages from different families also often have similar features. And again, I claim that's because they were subject to similar selective pressures. And interestingly, Andy Wadel, another phonologist who spoke in the Abralin series a few weeks ago, has a very similar slide um, <clears throat> in his talk, uh, again, showing different kinds of animals that all have wings uh, because they were subject to the same selective pressures. So, because it's not just Chinese that has this contrast between San, Di San, Three, Third, but also English, French, Trois, Troisième, uh, Hungarian, Harom, uh, Harmodic. Uh, so, it seems that in quite a few languages, the ordinals have an extra marker uh, that derives from, from the cardinals or the future tense. It's not just the Portuguese contrast between Caminha and Caminhara, but also German, Git. Belgian, Arabic, Tamshi, Safa Tamshi, Yoruba, Orin, um, future tense, Yomari, walks, will walk. English is, is the same, actually. And in the contrast between um, ordinary anaphoric pronouns and reflexive pronouns, we have the contrast in English, him, himself, similar to Japanese, Kare, Jibun, Chinese, Ta, Ta, Tsuchi, Turkish, Onu, Kendi, Ni. Now, there's one difference uh, that's important to keep in mind because in biology, we see convergent adaptations for diverse ecological niches. So uh, sharks and dolphins are adapted to living in the water, birds and bats to flying. You don't see this in linguistics in the same way because all languages basically occupy the same niche. In different cultures, we talk about our lives in very much the same way. Languages from different families in different continents often develop in similar ways because they have to fulfill the same basic function, helping language users get their ideas across to their interlocutors. Selective forces that lead to the differential transmission of linguistic variants are called functional adaptive constraints. I have a paper about this um, in a volume that appeared last year, Explanation in Typology. It's uh, the book that you can see here. It's a language science press book, so you don't have to buy it. Uh, you can download it for free. You, you can also buy a hard uh, copy, but it's uh, free to download. One powerful constraint on language use is a brevity clarity trade-off. Speakers prefer short forms, but hearers prefer clear forms and longer forms are usually clearer. An efficient way to trade off these demands is to use longer forms for less frequent meanings, resulting in form frequency correspondences. So this is something that I've thought particularly about. And uh, it's clearly something that applies to all languages, to all cultures uh, in the same way. So this brevity clarity trade-off is not a particular uh, niche of particular languages, it's really universal. 
So um, the examples that we already saw basically all illustrate this um, because in all those cases where there's an extra marker as in the ordinal numerals, in the future tense, uh, in the uh, reflexive pronouns, these forms are the rarer ones. So if you look at corpora, it's always that the ordinal numerals are less frequent than the cardinals, the future tense is less frequent than the present tense, the reflexive use is less frequent than the ordinary anaphoric use. Okay, so um, before we get into some more details, we have to reflect a little bit of what it means to explain language structures because they're different levels, different kinds of explanations. Linguists are interested in at least two different kinds of explanations or theories. On the one hand, there's explanation of speaker behavior. Here, the question is, why do people talk the way they talk? And most of the time, linguists describe or analyze particular languages. Such descriptions provide us with theories of speaker behavior. And uh, Chomsky said um, in a very clear way, a grammar of the language L is essentially a theory of L. So this is a language particular theory. I also call these P theories, theories of particular languages. So it's clear that these are theories and that they involve explanation. However, what I'm interested here in here is explanations of language structures. And here the question is, why are languages the way they are? So we also want general theories of language structures that explain the general properties of human language structures. And I call these G theories, theories of human language in general. These two types of theories are not always clearly distinguished in linguistics. Many linguists talk about linguistic theory uh, and then they somehow apply it to one particular language, but I, I find this a bit confused. So uh, again, another slide that makes it very clear. On the one hand, we have speaker behavior explained by grammar and dictionary, that's P theory. So basically like a Collins German dictionary and grammar, that's a theory uh, of German, of course, maybe not a very sophisticated one. On the other hand, we have properties of the world's languages and these uh, I claim uh, are most successfully explained by evolutionary adaptation. So again, general theories presuppose that we know what the general properties of human languages are. They must be based on worldwide trends. And it's important to note the properties of particular languages are often historical accident and cannot be explained. I put this in red here because it's sometimes overlooked. Uh, so for example, we, of course, we cannot explain why English for the ordinal numeral has six, Eng French has sixième, or Portuguese has caminhará, English has will walk, you know, why, why does English not have walkará, or <laughs> why is there a difference between caminhar and walk in the first place? Of course, the words are different for accidental reasons, and that also applies to many grammatical features. However, we can explain the general patterns. So there's a universal that the ordinal numeral is usually derived from the cardinal using a special marker. And another universal that the future tense form is usually longer than the present tense form using a special marker, an affix or auxiliary. And there's worldwide comparative work on this. So Stolz and Veselinova in the chapter of the World Atlas of Language Structures looked at ordinals and Dial Velupile looked at the formation of future tenses. Okay, so can we only explain and understand these general trends? Well, if a particular phenomenon is an instantiation of a general trend, then of course we can say that this general explanation illuminates a particular phenomenon. We could say explains it in a weak sense. So there's a contrast in English between walk and the future tense will walk. While we cannot explain it in a strict sense because it does not derive sort of directly from some adaptive force, but it's illuminated by the general explanation of universal two. Okay, so let's get now to two specific adaptationist theories of language structures. 
The overall purpose of this talk is not to provide a comprehensive picture of adaptive explanation. It would be far too much just to illustrate how they work. So this will be a um, sort of really overview, um, but um, just to make it um, quite concrete. So I'll talk about the dispersion theory of vowel systems and then the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding and grammar. Both of these are evolutionary adaptive explanations. So the dispersion theory of vowel systems started out with the observation that with overwhelmingly greater than chance frequency, vowel systems are triangular. This was documented very clearly by Madison 1984, and uh, you can see it relatively easily by looking at vowel systems even on Wikipedia, for example. This general trend can be explained as a trade-off between system richness and perceptual distinctness. In systems with three vowels, maximal perceptual distinctness can be achieved with the vowels E, A, U, and not, for example, E, U, I. In systems with five vowels, maximal perceptual distinctness can be achieved with the vowels E, E, A, O, U, and not, for example, with E, U, 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 U. These are possible vowel systems and presumably children would be able to acquire them, but they're not so perceptually distinct and the phoneticians have ways of measuring perceptual distinctness in an objective way. Um, <clears throat> so phoneticians have basically converged uh, that this is the right uh, explanation and you can read about this in Gordon's uh, recent book about phonological typology. So this theory explains the general tendency and it illuminates the triangular Arabic vowel system E, A, U that uh, I showed at the beginning. Okay, the next is the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding and grammar. This is something that I worked on quite extensively over the last years. The general pattern, it's found widely in the world's grammatical systems, is what I call form frequency correspondence. Two grammatical forms that contrast minimally differ substantially in frequency, and the more frequent one will tend to be coded by zero or a short marker, but the rarer one will tend to have an overt marker, at least if the coding is asymmetric. So the universals that we saw earlier about ordinals and future tense are just special instances of the larger form frequency correspondence universal. So remember these two universals about ordinals uh, and future tense, and uh, these forms also taking into account the reflexive marking. So all of these are instantiations of this uh, general form frequency correspondence universals. This can be explained as a trade-off between speaker effort and clarity for the hearer. Grammatical information can be coded symmetrically, so either uniformly, or it can be symmetric, uh, symmetrically zero, so simply left implicit. But grammatical information is coded asymmetrically, and the only efficient solution is overt coding for the less predictable form and zero coding for the more predictable form. But what is it that makes a form predictable? Well, one thing is high frequency of use. So the causal chain is from frequency to predictability and from predictability to shortness of coding, often zero coding. The efficiency theory of asymmetric coding explains a large number of general grammatical phenomena, starting with Zipf's law of abbreviation, which says that frequent words are short in all languages. This is very generally recognized, but it's not so widely recognized that this also applies to grammar. But for example, Croft in his book on typology and universals has a chapter on typological markedness um, where he sort of also hints at uh, frequency of use and predictability is an important uh, factor. But I would say that we don't even need a notion of markedness. Also all cases of differential coding like differential object marking um, can be explained uh, by the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding. Okay, so we have some quite powerful and widely accepted theories, but why has evolutionary adaptation 
be largely overlooked by linguists, or I should say by people working in morphology and syntax. Because as I said earlier, in phonology and phonetics, the situation is better. Why haven't morphosyntacticians used adaptive explanations regularly in contrast to biology where such explanations have long been standard? Actually, the efficiency theory that I mentioned is not new, but the fundamental ideas were really around even in the 19th century. So in 1872, Charles Darwin cited Max Müller. Remember, Müller was the guy who went to school in the building right nearby here in Leipzig. He was later professor of linguistics in Oxford and Darwin knew about him. So Darwin says in his book from 1872, you see variability in every tongue and new words are continually cropping up. But as, as there's a limit to the powers of the memory, single words like whole languages gradually become extinct. As Max Müller has well remarked, the struggle for life is constantly going on among the words and grammatical forms in each language. The better, the shorter, the easier forms are constantly gaining the upper hand and they owe their success their own inherent virtue. So this is somewhat uh, metaphorical language, but basically I think the ideas um, are the same. So they have been around for quite some time, but they're not so prominent. And uh, I will speculate a little bit what explains that. On the one hand, I think there's a certain cognitive bias in linguistics. Since the mid 20th century, uh, many linguists have primarily asked cognitive questions about language, even though we know that languages are similar to other types of cultural knowledge. So languages are limited to certain cultural groups, they undergo change over time, they show within group variation, so it's a linguistic variation, so it's exactly the same as other types of uh, cultural information. But still, we often think of languages as primarily mental entities and language acquisition is primarily viewed as a process of cognitive development, not as a process of enculturation. Even though I would say they're both and we should also take into account the cultural aspects. So as a result of this cognitive bias, many linguists have focused on possible biocognitive explanations of language structures. This is well known from authors such as Tomsky, Lanneker and Jackendorf. Historical or evolutionary explanations have been backgrounded or ignored by many linguists. In addition to this bias toward cognitive explanations, there's also a bias toward P linguistics. Remember, distinguished between the study of particular languages and uh, uh, development of general theories on the basis of general properties of language. 95% of all linguists focus on studying specific particular languages and they try to explain these. But I think the adaptive pressures on language structures are not always evident in particular languages. All languages have strange and non-adaptive features that are historical accidents. For example, English requires insertion of do with negation plus replacement of the tensed verb by the bare infinitive. She arrived, she did not arrive, right? You can't say she not arrived or she did not arrived, it has to be she did not arrive, kind of really strange pattern, which is unusual, it does not correspond to any cross-linguistic trend. It's a historical accident that cannot be explained. Remember earlier I said the properties of particular languages are historical accidents. For linguists to focus on just one language, it's frustrating, so it's understandable that the entire adaptive approach does not appeal to them so much. And unfortunately, the P-linguistic bias has become much stronger in the 20th century. In the 19th and early 20th century, really all linguists studied multiple languages, but then in the 1960s, it became respectable to study only one language in depth. And this is of course related to globalization. Smaller languages are getting less and less important. And a few big languages are taken over. In English, science, in science, English is largely taken over. So we don't think so much about cultural diversity anymore. I mean, in linguistics, the situation is actually pretty good because there's a lot of attention on small languages, also on, on the fact that languages are dying and so on. So, so there is some um, awareness of this, uh, but we also have to take into account these big uh, global trends. <clears throat> 
Another factor, I think, is that functional explanations have often been wrongly attempted at the level of particular languages. So most linguists study a single language, so they would love to understand that language, so they've often attempted functional explanations at language particular level. So Heyman, for example, noted that there's a contrast between kill and cause to die. It means something a bit different in English. And he appealed to iconicity and to functional explanation to explain this English fact. But I think the uh, generality of the explanatory factor and the specificity of the English phenomenon, they don't fit very well together. If you have a highly general explanatory factor, it has to result in highly general results. So we would have to observe a cross-linguistic trend. So a right level for functional adaptive explanations is not the individual language, but is large scale cross-linguistic patterns. So it's not surprising that many people find such functional explanations unconvincing, and I actually agree. Okay, and finally, it's simply a fact that large-scale cross-linguistic comparison is difficult. Naturalists have long compared different species, and until recently, most botanists and zoologists were knowledgeable about hundreds of thousands of species and their ecological features. Even, you know, if you don't go out to the countryside very much, you can go to a museum and there you have a lot of direct evidence of lots of different species. That's much harder. Um, in linguistics, we cannot have firsthand experience of so many different languages. Comparing them is difficult. Words are similar only if the languages share a common ancestor. Grammatical features are really hard to describe and hard to compare. And we do have quite a few worldwide studies of grammatical patterns as in the worldwide, in the world atlas of language structures. So I mentioned Stolz and Mercedinova on ordinals, Dahl and Velopile on future tense. But for many other grammatical phenomena, worldwide cross-linguistic comparison is difficult and we haven't made so much progress yet. So this brings me to the dative alternations. At the beginning, I also mentioned the English dative alternation. Kim gave him the money versus Kim gave it to her brother. So what can we say about this? 15 years ago, I looked at types of ditransitive constructions with give in the world's languages in my chapter in the World Atlas of Language Structures, but I did not study dative alternation systematically. It was too difficult. Grammars don't describe them very well so often. But in later work, I found that there's actually pretty good evidence for a worldwide trend showing that the English contrast is not a historical accident. And um, I now think uh, we can state the universal number five, the low prominent recipient flagging universal. If a language has a coding split or coding alternation and recipient marking, then the recipient will show an at position or case marker, a flag, if the recipient argument has low referential prominence. In other words, the recipient tends to be flagged if it's indefinite, not definite, inanimate, not animate, a full nominal rather than a personal pronoun, or focused rather than topical. Similar contrasts to the English dative alternation can also be found in other languages. For example, Portuguese has a prepositional dative split. So we have Kim deu o dinheiro, Kim gave him the money, and Kim deu o dinheiro ao irmão. So this is not so different from English, except that it's a split in Portuguese. So in Portuguese, you cannot say Kim deu o irmão o dinheiro. So in, in Portuguese, it's quite strictly uh, attached to pronoun versus uh, full nominal. In English, it's, the situation is more complex. And in many cases, English has an alternation. In Wolof, that's a West African language, we have something similar here involving uh, definiteness. So if I say I gave the girl a bicycle, I don't need any special dative marker. But, I, but if I say I gave the bicycle to a girl, then I have to have the dative preposition C. Now, this universal low prominent recipient flagging is actually not mysterious. The explanation for this worldwide tendency lies in the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding that we already saw. Uh, 
because the universal five is actually just a special case of the universal four. Universal four was about asymmetric coding in general. Universal five is about asymmetric coding of the recipient. And, it, and the form frequency corresponding talks about frequency. Now, if we look at frequency, we see that, you know, with really much greater than chance frequency, recipients are high prominence arguments. So they tend to be definite, um, they tend to be animate, they tend to be um, personal pronouns, uh, they tend to be topical. Low prominence recipients are rare and rare meanings tend to be expressed by overt markers. So the famous English dative alternation actually can be subsumed under the form frequency universal. So an adaptive explanation is available not only for the simpler cases of cardinal ordinal asymmetries or present future asymmetries, which you might say, oh, well, that's pretty trivial. That's not so exciting, but Adapt, adapt, adaptive explanation is also uh, available for differential coding phenomena like differential object marking, which is known to be a quite complex phenomenon, and also for dative alternations and splits. Also, adaptive explanations are available for general tendencies of reflexive marking. They've been widely discussed under the heading of binding theory, um, and uh, most of this literature um, um, goes back to the work of Reinhardt and Chomsky of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, but actually, when you look at what's really cross-linguistically general, uh, then you find that the coding asymmetries can be explained by frequency of use and efficient coding. So I have this Japanese example here again. And so we see that basically in, in uh, all languages that have an asymmetry, and most languages do, um, there's uh, reflexive pronoun is longer because it's less predictable because it's less frequent. So I think the great majority of coding universals uh, can apparently be explained by the efficiency theory of asymmetric coding. And also the word order universals have a good adaptive explanation. So what are the universals are there apart from universals of coding and word order universals? These really are the major morphosyntactic universals. So that's why I said quite optimistically, most successful explanations of language structures are based on evolutionary adaptation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about adaptation and language change now. I don't really have much to contribute there, but let me share a few thoughts. Just as evolutionary adaptation comes with evolutionary change in biology, linguistic adaptation also happens in language change. Languages change all the time. The variants are created, adaptive variants are selected from these variants. So I, I already said this. But unfortunately, this does not imply that we can understand all or even most instances of language change as adaptive. In fact, it seems that most language change is adaptively neutral, perhaps mostly random. So consider again the change leading to this special uh, situation in English negation, the uh, obligatory do insertion. So we have, she arrived, she did not arrive. Now in earlier English, actually it was possible to say she arrived, she arrived not. That was actually pretty simple and regular, right? So a change happened, which made English irregular. She did not arrive. It did not make English in any way uh, better somehow, better for hero or speaker. So it's really a strange uh, development and, and I think it's probably just random. It's not driven by adaptation, has no adaptive result and many language changes seem to be of this kind or maybe even most. But again, this is parallel to evolutionary biology. Many or most biological changes are random drift. There's really no contradiction or tension here. We can say that when changes can be explained, they're adaptively motivated, but not all changes can be explained. There's a lot that's simply random. I, I think, you know, language uh, change and uh, evolutionary change, it's like human biographies, right? A, a lot of things that happen to, uh, 
us in our lives are somehow good developments and adaptive, but there's also a lot of random change, a lot of things that happen, uh, you know, without there being any reason. So I don't think this should be uh, somehow worrisome. Okay, now what about biocognitive explanations? I noted earlier that since the 20th century, especially the mid 20th century, many linguists have focused on possible biocognitive explanations of language structures. Uh, but most of this work in this tradition is focused on language particular analyses, explanations of speaker behavior, not of language structures. So Chomsky in 1957, syntactic structures actually talked about uh, the structures of English. Um, so um, it's sort of not so clear it, to, to what extent these explanations are really general explanations. Remember again, contrast between P series and G series. So I think many of the theories uh, proposed uh, in this biocognitive framework are really more of the P theory type. And this is not something that I want to address today. Um, but there have also been a number of proposals of innate universal building blocks from which all languages are constructed. And these are obviously relevant to general explanations of language structures. So they're also called architectural or formal universals and substantive universals of universal grammar. So we have proposals of architectural building blocks, such as deep structure versus surface structure, lexicon versus syntax, phrase structure versus transformational rules, syntactic versus post-syntactic operations, inflectional versus derivational rules. There are also proposals about substantive universals, such as substantive uh, phonological features uh, of uh, Chomsky and Hall in 1968. Actually, there was also an Abralin talk by Mark van Oostendorp, uh, who talked specifically about these building blocks, the atoms of language, as he calls them uh, on this slide here, that go back to Jakobson originally, but then, then were adopted by Chomsky and Halley and many others. Uh, another set of substantive universals is lexical categories, noun, verb, and adjective, as in Baker, functional categories of the verb, as in Chinkwe's work, constraints of optimality theory, as uh, McCarthy semantic primes of natural meta language, as in Vizpitska's work. These innate building blocks are really interesting proposals, and they've been widely discussed, but without definitive conclusions. They're rarely presented as hypotheses, and they're often simply presupposed to be true. So we don't really know to what extent we have made progress in understanding what the real building blocks are. So there are kind of different traditions of linguists that assume different building blocks and so on. So, so I think these attempts have not been uh, so successful. We might compare the situation with mid 19th century biology when there were different basic principles. Darwin called them two great laws of the 1850s. So on the one hand, there was adaptation what Darwin called conditions of existence. This was actually well-established um, explanatory um, idea. So Darwin did not invent adaptation. He just uh, showed how adaptation can derive from evolutionary change. The other basic principle was morphological homology or unity of type. So, so these were really two contrasting um, ways of uh, thinking, of explaining uh, the properties of biological organisms, but uh, at the latest in the 20th century neo-Darwinian synthesis, it's become clear that these are not different distinct principles, but they're just different effects of evolutionary changes, which are partially constrained by natural selection. So maybe in linguistics, we will also somehow manage to reduce these proposals of building blocks to some larger uh, adaptive um, conception. Okay, so to conclude this talk, let me point to two other ways in which adaptation um, plays a role in helping us understand language as a language. So first, um, adaptation, um, as I highlighted in this talk, adaptation to the universal needs of speakers in the process of cultural evolution. Uh, 
Um, so most successful explanations of language structures are based on evolutionary adaptation. You know, by most, you know, I, it's very vague. It's not really different from many, but I'm optimistic that functional adaptive explanations will be shown to be much more successful in the future. Than many linguists you nowadays suspect. But in addition, there's also adaptation to specific natural or social environments. Remember, I said earlier uh, that the environment is really the same for all languages because people talk about their lives in much the same way. However, sometimes specific physical environments or even specific cultural types of food processing or specific kinds of social organization play a role. And there have been some studies recently uh, about tone languages in regions with high humidity, languages with labial lab dental sounds uh, in agricultural societies, languages with little morphology and large scale societies. So again, Caleb Everett uh, would be the reference here. He talked about uh, these uh, studies about tone humidity and labial dental sounds in agricultural societies. So that's also a type uh, of uh, adaptive explanation. And I think these explanations are quite harmonious with the more universalist explanations that I have focused on. Um, but in addition, of course, there's also the idea that human linguisticality, the biological capacity for language, can be explained as a biological adaptation, or even that specific features of linguisticality can be said to be specific adaptations to specific needs. There was a famous paper by Pinker and Bloom, and this is also discussed by McMahon and McMahon. So this also has to be mentioned uh, when we talk about evolutionary adaptation. But as I said earlier, um, I'm focusing here on the uh, cultural evolution and adaptation of morphosyntax, which is not so well, well known yet. So, you know, the biological adaptation hypothesis is is really quite different because it works at a different time scale. And also, you know, I find it that adaptive explanations for linguisticality are really hard to prove because linguisticality is such a, a unique feature of the animal kingdom. I think in biology, as in linguistics, adaptive hypotheses are ideally tested on the basis of large scale cross species comparisons. So if you have a unique feature of just one species, I think you, you can't really say much about it. Okay, but overall I end with an optimistic conclusion, namely that evolutionary adaptation provides good explanations for many language structures, um, explanations of worldwide tendencies, and that the study of the evolution of languages, the kind of cultural evolution, is an important complement to cognitively oriented linguistics. Okay, that brings me to the end, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Yes. Thank you again, Professor Hasmumat, for your really interesting talk. Now I'm going to start the question session. Um, one first question that uh, appears on the chat is from Giuseppe Varaskin. And he asked, is frequency a primitive in the explanation of structures? Shouldn't difference in frequency between anaphoric pronouns and reflexives for instance, be an explanando in its own right? Yes, thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. Whenever uh, we uh, uh, appeal to some explanatory factor, we have to think about what is it that explains this explanatory factor. And I appealed to um, frequency, and I said that it caused predictability. And uh, yes, indeed, I think we, uh, it's interesting to ask what is the cause of frequency. So why is it, uh, for example, that people use uh, cardinal numerals more frequently than ordinal numerals? Or why do they use the present tense more frequently than the future tense? In the present and future tense case, it's maybe easy, because we don't know so much about the future. So that's why we talk a lot about uh, the present tense. In the case of reflexives and non-reflexive anaphoric pronouns, you know, again, it's interesting to ask, and I think it's not so difficult to to find an answer because uh, you know most of the time we talk about human actions, and mostly 
human A acts on human B, and we don't act on ourselves the same way we act on others uh, very often. So that simply doesn't occur so often for, uh, I think, understandable reasons. Um, I think the reasons why we get frequency asymmetries are rather heterogeneous. So in the case of reflexives, non-reflexives, the reason is very different from the difference between present and future tense, for example. And uh, the difference between cardinal and ordinal, I actually, I don't have such a good explanation. So why don't we say very often, uh, you know, the tense, why do we say 10 more often than the tense? I, I don't know. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't matter. So I don't focus so much on frequency, but in principle, of course, one should ask about these. Uh... Okay, thank you. Um, now I have another question from uh, Therese Land. Um, she asks, would you count esteem alternation as a kind of overt marking? And she asked that because uh, you said that less frequent forms like the future tense is often longer or additionally marked. Form with, forms with stem alternation, like some Swedish past, term, past tense verbs forms, are not longer but shorter, yet they feel even more marked than the weak past tense forms, which are longer. Okay, yeah, so in some Germanic languages, uh, Swedish was mentioned, I mean in English, it's also the case, right, in some verbs, the past tense is formed by changing the vowel and not by adding a marker. Um, so uh, there, what I would say is that we should really look at the length of the forms in terms uh, of segments. That's really the best. And um, yeah, overall uh, in uh, English and Swedish, that sort of conforms to the general trend that past tense forms tend to be longer than present tense forms, but this trend actually is pretty weak. I, the reason I spoke about present versus future is that it's a strong trend, but the present versus past contrast is much weaker. And yeah, no, so maybe the fact that in English and Swedish, many past tense forms are not longer, maybe that's, that's part of this. I think also if you look at frequency of usage, present tense and past tense are not so different apart in terms of frequency. Overall, present seems to be more frequent than past, but not by such a clear margin. Okay. Um, there was a comment by Luana Amaral <laughs> that um, in some dialects, uh, it, like hers in Portuguese, uh, the dative allows that uh, alternation that in principle the professor said was not allowed um, by the use of a preposition when you have the recipient. Um, so make, uh, the, I'm making a question by this comment, like how do you take in account this variation in uh, productivity on the structures um, to, to deal with this evolutionary process? It might be the case that one language allows more than, than one possible um, structure, right? Yeah. Um... I haven't quite made up my mind yet whether I want to claim that if there's variation in a language, um, you know, sometimes maybe dialectal variation, as you mentioned, um, sometimes, you know, simply both variants being acceptable, um, you know, perhaps distributed a little bit in some directions. If I want to say that the variation is always in the adaptive uh, direction, because if that was the case, that would be wonderful. Then, because then what I'm saying would be relevant also for p-linguistics, right? Also for linguists studying one particular language. And uh, my my colleague Natalia Levshina has studied variants of English quite extensively, and she has found a lot of evidence for you know subtle variants in English varying according to these principles of frequency and predictability. So maybe one can say that. So maybe, you know, if you have a Portuguese speaker who actually allows uh, both of these variants, then you will find that they will actually use the variant with the A more if the recipient is less prominent according to universal five. So that would be worth looking at. It's, 
I, I think I would sort of expect this, but I don't know if I want to predict it. So, uh, so you know, I'm sort of a bit hesitant because I'm, I'm a worldwide typologist. I'm not a variation expert, but it's, it's a really interesting question. Okay, thank you one more time. There is another question by Yasin Tashdemir. Um, what does the dative alternation say about the nature of the relationship between morphology and syn syntax? And she comments, it seems flagging should be done somehow if only syntax morphology, syntax morphology is available. It does the job single-handedly, like Mandarin and Turkish. If there are two options, syntax and morphology, they only one, then only one does it. So repeating the question, what does the dative alternation say about the nature of the relationship between morphology and syntax? Okay, I talked about morphosyntax, uh, not so much about morphology versus syntax, because I'm not sure that there's a real difference between morphology and syntax. So, you know, in my thinking, um, you know, it's not so much the building blocks that play a role. You know, remember, I did talk about uh, the idea of universal building blocks, but the evidence for these universal innate building blocks is generally pretty weak. So we don't have good evidence that, you know, in the organization of our cognitive grammars or so, that morphology and syntax are distinct. So I think probably the reason why linguists talk about morphology and syntax has to do with the way we spell our words. So if some marker is always spelled together with the root, then it's an affix. And if it's not always spelled together, then we call it an adposition. So um, I don't think that the morphology syntax distinction is really relevant. And I found quite a few uh, generalizations that cut across this morphology syntax divide. So, so I've stopped worrying about morphology versus syntax. Okay. Um, again, Giuseppe Varaskin, uh, he asked for a um, clarification. So don't we have to assume basic innate building blocks, phonological future or syntactic categories in order to establish typological general relations that can be explained on adaptive grounds? Yeah, good questions. How do we establish these cross-linguistic generalizations? What are the, the concepts that we use? So when I say that the future tense uh, it tends to be more marked in the present tense or ordinals as opposed to cardinals, don't I presuppose universal building blocks? And I thought about this for a long time, but I think the answer is no. So the elements of which individual grammars are made are language particular categories. But the concepts in terms of which the cross-linguistic generalizations are formulated are comparative concepts uh, that are defi defined in such a way that they can apply to all languages regardless of their systems. So uh, different languages have different systems, different languages require different language particular categories, but these cross-linguistic generalizations uh, require uniformly defined uh, comparative concepts. I've also called uh, them uniform units of measurement. They're, they're really more like uh, you know, in other science, like when physicists or meteorologists or so, you know, when meteorologists measures the amount of clouds or something like that, right? They, they have these objective measurements and there's, you know, cloud is not something that exists in nature. So similarly, I don't think that future tense is something that is given in advance, but I can define it as a form that has a certain tense uh, value and then I look uh, what language particular categories are found in the languages. Okay. Um, another question by Antonio Lafuria is, um, if it, it, did, you use, um, did you use data from so-called pidgins and Creole languages in those studies? On evolution? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I mean, I did not present to you uh, sort of any large scale um, cross linguistic data here. My work uh, over the last 10, 15 years has primarily been 
conceptual work bringing together uh, you know, the similarities of all these different domains. But in 2013, uh, we published the uh, Atlas of Pidgin Creole Language Structures together with uh, Susanne Michaelis, uh, Magnus Huber, and Philip Maurer. Um, and uh, the work on these languages was really very important in uh, also shaping my thinking of what happens in the world's languages. And it's particularly interesting, and Susanne Michaelis is uh, currently working um, on this. Uh, she's actually sharing an office uh, with me here, uh, where she looks at Pidgin Creole um, <clears throat> languages and how the changes uh, that happened, uh, you know, compared to um, the lexifier languages, also sometimes compared to the uh, substrate languages, how these provide evidence for the functional adaptive forces. Okay, thank you one more time. Um, there is another question by Marcia dos Santos Machado Vieira, and uh, she asks, could you talk about cross-linguistic comparisons normally based on idealized written norms of the language put in comparison um, as, for, for example, there is there a limit to the researcher's knowledge of the multifaceted system of a language? Well, yeah, I mean, for these large scale cross-linguistic studies, it's not really possible to take into account all the variation. And uh, uh, of course there's variation and with written languages, uh, you know, there's a strong tendency for the written forms to, you know, diverge a little bit from the spoken forms. They're often more conservative. Uh, but I have found that the differences do not matter so much. So we see uh, the evidence uh, for, especially for the efficiency of coding in much the same way in a written language as we see it in spoken languages. So it seems that, uh, you know, these um, really deep principles of, you know, trade-off speaker interest, hearer interest, the brevity, clarity, uh, trade-off, that applies in the same way uh, to written language. So you we use abbreviations, not only in spoken language, but also in written language. So I think these general principles apply everywhere. Okay. Um, Swingdar uh, Guarayu uh, asked it, um... On the slide 137, you discussed that what you present as universal five is possibly not on the same hierarchical level as the first listed universals one to four. Uh, is your idea now to present a list of universes um, without any hierarchical categ categorization or is it only a chronological way of presenting another universal in your talk? Okay, so, yeah, sorry, that may have been a bit confusing. So this, what I call universal four, is the, the overarching generalization, and the other universals uh, are, uh, well, universal one, two, and five are special cases of universal four, and the universal three was the phonetic one. So, so the reason I numbered them was, you know, that was the kind of tribute to Joseph Greenberg, who had universal one to universal 44. Greenberg, uh, I think, was uh, the one linguist in the 20th century who advanced the study of language universals the most. And um, so, you know, I sometimes label universals in this way, but the numbers don't matter. And yes, ideally, one would have, uh, you know, a hierarchical set of universals with specific universals being special cases of larger universals. Okay, nice. We are reaching the last questions. Um, Anna Clara Polakov asked, if higher frequency goes to predictability, then to shorter coding, could uh, a shorter form that starts to be more frequent result in an adaptive change, an accidental change, or be either way? Um, so what, what I said is that the causal chain is from frequency to predictability to shortness. And so what happens sometimes is that forms that get more frequent also become shorter. So they can get shortened by phonological change or they can get shortened by clipping. I did not talk so much about, or actually I hardly talked about the diachronic processes uh, 
and lead to shorter forms. So, so George Zipp, who talked about these things in 1935, a long time ago, he said that the most important process is perhaps clipping. So we have laboratory. When we talk about a laboratory, very often we just say lab. Um, or when we talk, you know, at universities about professors, very frequently you just say prof. Or so you know, we have so sort of this clipping. Um, but actually, I think. Uh, the processes are quite diverse and the phonological shortening is not the most important process um, uh, that leads to frequent, frequently expressed meanings being expressed by short forms. So, so what we also have is that less frequently expressed meanings tend to be lengthened. So if you look at the English contrast between him and himself, for example, in Old English, there was no difference. Right? So you would say, he saw him in the mirror, uh, and that could mean the other guy or himself. And then only later on, this word self was added to the him. So it was not that the him was shortened, but something was added. And in the case of himself, it was pretty transparent what was added. In other cases, it's not so transparent. So in the French, in the case of French C and sixième, right? Sixième is a six. So this sixième, this was added. In Latin, you didn't have that. You had sex and sextus. So where did the French get em from? Sixième, right? That's complicated. There was some kind of analogical change. So the sources, uh, diachronic sources leading to the asymmetric coding can be really quite diverse. Uh, so I focus on the uh, evolutionary adaptation of the results because we can explain the results. And I think from the result-oriented perspective, we can also then uh, understand the changes better. But uh, the changes are often not really transparent. Okay, thank you. Um, David Dinash uh, asks a question. As you observe, linguistic linguistically is such a unique feature in nature. Isn't language origin a puzzle for an evil adaptive approach? That is, why aren't other primates more linguistical? Yeah, linguisticality is unique. Um, <laughs> and the question, I cannot, I certainly cannot answer. I have not uh, studied biological evolution uh, I have been inspired by biological evolution, uh, but uh, you know, I said explicitly, I think you know, there may be a bit too much energy going into understanding biological evolution of human linguisticality because it's a unique trait. You know, think of a unique trait uh, of uh, some language, you know, something kind of really funny uh, that only one language has. You know, there are occasions we have these things then we can speculate that it might have an adaptive value, but we can't really show it. We can't really distinguish accidental uh, developments from uh, adaptive developments. So I think the same is true actually for biology. So, you know, of course, as humans, we want to understand where we come from, why we are the way they are, we are. But, you know, it could be that it was just an accident. So it's me that's really hard to, to accept, uh, but certainly I think biologists, uh, many biologists would, would say so. They would say, oh, these crazy linguists they are kind of obsessed with humans. You know, if I study elephants, I'm not obsessed with understanding the elephant's trunk either. You know, elephant's trunks are rare. So yeah, it's just so happened that was some kind of accidental development, so maybe human language also was an accidental development. But it's nice that we have it and can talk to each other, <laughs> so. Definitely. Um, another question is, how far we can push the idea of Darwinian adaptation in linguistics? And to what extent should we consider other culturally specific evolutionary process and the role of the, the sorry, developmental constraints? Mm. Well, adaptation, um, I find it attractive because it seems to provide true explanations. 
And for other constraints, I, I think there probably are other constraints. Uh, there, there are quite a few features of languages that I can't explain by adaptation, but I don't know other good explanations either. Um, so, um, you know, that's why I said most of the successful explanations uh, are adaptive, but we should certainly look out for all kinds of other approaches and also in biology, actually, there is a big debate about the role of adaptations. Um, so, so since the uh, late 1970s, there's really something like an a controversy of adaptationism. So some people have said that biologists put too much emphasis on adaptive explanations and they should take into account accidents or other sorts of things, uh, you know, evil devil um, considerations and so on. So, so it's an ongoing um, discussion also in biology and it's the same in linguistics, you know. The only thing that I'm trying to say is that linguistics should be more like biology in that uh, evolutionary adaptive explanations should have a, a much more prominent role. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm really curious about something, so I will take the liberty to ask you. Um, grammaticalization process, in a way, uh, seems uh, to go together with some kind of evolutionary process. So my question is uh, how grammaticalization might be related to, to this evolution of language? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, about 20 years ago, I <laughs> thought a lot about grammaticalization and I wrote a couple of papers about grammaticalization. And at the time I was quite optimistic that grammaticalization provided strong constraints on the kinds of changes that uh, we, uh, we see. And, and I still think that there's a lot of similarities between uh, uh, many changes, so like development, of uh, tense and aspect markers of the kind that Bybee and Dahl talked about, or the development of definite articles from demonstratives, or the development of adpositions from spatial nouns, or um, you know, developments of this kind where grammatical markers arise from sort of more concrete uh, markers. This is also something that uh, we see quite a bit in Creole languages, and Susanna Michaelis and I have. A, a recent forthcoming paper um, <clears throat> about this. So, so yes, there, there is this sort of tendency of grammaticalization, but I now tend to think of grammaticalization as a non-adaptive kind of change. I don't want to say that it's um, completely random because it does seem to be comprehensible. It seems like an inflationary process. So in economics, that's, that's a different, neighboring discipline now, right? So, so biology is one neighboring discipline to linguistics. Economics uh, has observed inflationary processes and has tried to understand them. And, and I think Ersten Dahl was quite right to point out that grammaticalization changes have a lot in common with inflationary processes because there's some sort of some new thing that's used more and more. And at the end of the process, well, it's devalued in the same way, right? Think of the famous romance future. I gave this example of Caminera. It's from the Latin um, habere future or habere uh, periphrasis, but Latin had a perfectly good future tense. So, so the romance future tense is not any kind of improvement over the Latin one. So there's some kind of recycling going on, some kind of inflationary recycling and, um, and I, I think it's, it's something that obeys different rules. And it also sometimes leads to, to, to kind of strange non-adaptive effects. So for example, in, in French and also in uh, German, um, the old perfect was changed its meaning. It's now used as the ordinary past tense. So, uh, you know, in order to say, I sang, in German, I normally don't say ich sang, you say ich habe gesungen. So I'm like, I have sung. So we use the, the, um, the have uh, perfect. Now, what we have as a result is we have two different past tense forms, one more colloquial, ich habe gesungen, one more literary, ich sang. 
the one is longer, but it's more frequent. The other one is shorter, but it's rare. So that seems paradoxical. Mm. However, uh, you know, this contrast is a German specific contrast and this from Yizang is really on its way out. So, you know, this process, I, I think it's a result of an inflationary development and it's, there's not any kind of adaptation involved. I don't know, but I, I keep thinking about it, and and it's it's a really good question. It's 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 not easy to answer. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I think we got almost all our questions answered. I hope at least, <laughs> and I would like to thank you one more time for participating on this initiative. And okay, uh, thank you also. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.